While the photo you put up was in 1996, that scenario is probably going on right now with other players, no doubt. Yep. Yep. And I... I think at a level higher, much higher than what we really know. Because I'm convinced. And maybe I've got some personal um, evidence to support this without disclosing anything. But for every player that a club is aware of that is going through a mental health condition, there will be other players at every one of the clubs that has not, set, has not said anything because of the same fears that I had. You had a strained relationship with Dennis Pagan. Do you think it was a result of what you were going through? Yeah, no doubt, because the last thing I needed, and anybody who, is, who watches this, who's gone through these type of conditions or is at the moment, or you're supporting somebody who has, you'll understand the negative, toxic, internal conversations that are going on. A two-time best and fairest premiership player, vice captain, life member, Hall of Fame inductee, had no confidence, hated the person that he'd become, saw no positive self-worth that he had about what he did or to the organisation and the people that he was engaging with, to the point where I wanted to end my life. So I was so negative and I had no ability or emotional intelligence to break that thought process, to reach out and ask for help, to invest the time to learn the skills that helped me to begin to get an understanding and then control back in my life, like I'd done with my entire footy career. So I was so negative towards myself, the last thing I needed was a coach that was, was negative. And Dennis was a hard taskmaster um, and I'm grateful for what he was able to do with a very talented, immature group of players. Um, and history, history supports that. But there were so many times where I just wanted to cuddle. I wanted a hug, pat on the head. I just wanted, I wanted to be loved because I'd fallen out of love with myself. If that, sound, if that makes sense, I hated who I was. And it was really difficult because I'm fighting this private internal battle and I've got a really demanding coach who's going really hard and pushing me as a, cap, a vice captain. And he had every right to. I just wish I'd given him the opportunity and taken the chance. Who knows what the response would have been, but I, I certainly contributed to it. There's no doubt in my mind. Through that period, did you resent him? And even after, did you, did you hate him? Uh, yeah, if I'm being honest. I'm not proud to say that. And I've done a lot of reflecting about that, which is one of the reasons why I'd, I'd be keen just to sit down with Dennis and, and have that conversation because I feel, I feel partly responsible that I made certain decisions in order to protect one area of my life, and that was the coach-player relationship and the opportunity that came with playing with North. But it was much bigger than that. Um, so I, I, I carried a lot of, I played a lot of my football out of spite. You know, he challenged me, he questioned me, uh, he was negative towards me and a lot of other players. That's just the way that Dennis went about his business. And I took that very personally. But it's, it's something that I've had to make peace with on a personal level. And I know this is important to you to point out, this is in no way saying that there's any blame to be placed on Dennis because he didn't actually know what you were going through, is that right? How can you make an informed decision about how you engage with a certain person in your life without understanding what that person's going through? I was never going to allow him to do that. So if I was in the same position today, what would I do differently? I'd walk into Dennis's office, I'd close the door with Harry in there and maybe Rachel and I'd sit down and say, Dennis, this is what I'm dealing with, mate. I need you to understand because I'm not 100%. And for me to be 100%, I need your support. And I'd like to think that I would have got that. If he was sitting here right now, what would you say to him? I'd probably say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I didn't sit down and talk to you. I'm sorry I didn't have the trust and faith in you to be honest with you. Um, for a long time, I'd never thought I'd say something like that, but that's what I'd say. And I'd, I'd like to just have an honest conversation with a man that was influential in my sporting career. Um, because resentment and, and hate and spite, they don't serve anybody. Um, but I was so fearful and, and frightened of the potential fallout that I never said anything to him. And I think that's, that's unfair. It was unfair to him and it was unfair to me. 
because I never gave myself the opportunity to heal. So with what you've gone through, what's your message to them and other high profile people that may be in fear of coming out and saying what's wrong? It's easy for me to say now because I've made significant decisions. I spent 12 and a half years doing everything I could to hide my conditions. I've come to realise that all of the things that I was convinced that I would lose, my father's relationship, the relationship that I have with my wife, all of my former teammates were great mates, but in particular, Glenn Archer, Anthony Stevens, Ian Fairley, Anthony Rock and two non-footballing mates. They were my closest friends, male friends during that period. I can't tell you the number of times where I was on the verge of tears in their company at a football club, on a plane, at a hotel, about to go out into battle, at someone's house, and I desperately wanted to talk to them. But I never allowed myself to do that, never once, because I was convinced that if they knew that I was living with mental health conditions, they would not want to be a part of my life. And I wasn't prepared to sacrifice that. Yet, when I eventually decided to tell my story publicly, 1st of March 2006, all of the things that I thought that I would lose, I never lost. I never lost them. So I spent 12 and a half years of my life convincing myself that I cannot take the risk of telling the key people in my life because I'll lose them. So what is my message? My message would be the same for elite level football players, coaches, administrators and people in the broader community like your fan base. You can still be incredibly successful whilst living with mental health conditions. It doesn't have to stop you or prevent you. It's a really difficult road but we prioritise our physical health because it's important. Why is it important? We want to live as long as we can. We want to be fit, we want to be healthy, we want to be able to perform at work, we want to be able to do the things outside of our professional life. So human beings attach a, a significant intrinsic value to our physical health. Our emotional health, our ability to cope mentally is just as, if not more important to our physical health. Why would I say that? If we look at our, our body as a vehicle, our carriage to get us from point A to point B are our arms and our legs and our physical body. And our motor is under our bonnet right here. And when you make the decisions that I made and I ignored the fact that my motor wasn't running well, eventually it manifested itself physically. I can't tell you the number of games that I played and my last 184 games of football at North and Sydney were all played under the influence of depression, anxiety and obsessive compulsive disorder. I played a number of games, a lot of games, where I was there physically, but I was not there emotionally. I was broken spiritually, I was lost. So my message to anybody that sees this is if you aren't feeling like, or you are noticing that there is something that is having a negative impact on your ability emotionally, approach it exactly the same way as you do physically, because the sooner you get to a doctor, sooner you can understand what the issue is, sooner you can develop a plan to help you recover from the injury of your mind like you would with a hamstring or a calf muscle or any physical injury. And I don't think sacrificing your health mentally and emotionally is worth anything. I think you need to prioritise it and I think that when we can do that, people have a greater ability to cope, overcome challenges and obstacles and then enjoy everything that life's got to offer. So what's the role that Pucker Up is playing? Pucker Up is it pucker is a hindi word and it means authentic and genuine and i was neither of those two things for 12 and a half years so they're important daily reminders to me that i need to be authentic and genuine when it comes to my mental health and i am but it's also a message that we're trying to educate and empower other people to to be because when you're open and honest about your mental health you're not spending any time pretending to other people that you're healthy and well and happy if you're not and what we are focusing on with Pucker Up is our vision is to stamp out suicide. Why is that important? Because in 2016, 2,866 people ended their lives by suicide. That's seven people a day. 2,151 were men, 715 were women. And 65,500 people attempt the same outcome every year in Australia. This is an issue that is not gender specific. This is a human being problem. So by the end of today, there are seven people 
and seven families and seven communities that are having to come to terms with the fact that those seven people will not come back into their family or friend networks or communities again. So our vision is to stamp out suicide because I genuinely believe that suicide is an outcome to a crisis and I don't believe people need to get into a crisis before they start to ask for help. And unfortunately, without this being critical of the mental health industry and sector, most of the attention, the investment, the services, and the wonderful people that, that help people in crisis are focused at the crisis end. Parker Up wants to fundamentally shift the focus away from crisis to normalizing mental health and emotional well-being, educating people and empowering people that when we prioritize our mental health like we do our physical health, we prevent a crisis. And when we prevent crisis, we prevent the outcome, which is suicide. And that's what we do. Have any of the teammates that you were worried about coming forward to um, come out since and said, look, I knew something was wrong or well done? Do you think that they actually knew? Uh, it's a good question. I've, it's, it's, it's a really good question because um, we've done a Pucker Up podcast series. If people are interested, it's on Podcast One or iTunes, P-U-K-A-U-P. Series one was with a number of high profile people. My first guest was my former teammate at North Melbourne and then an assistant coach at Sydney, Johnny Longmire. And I asked him in the interview, I said, were you aware? He goes, no, but your behavior and some of your behavioral patterns always had me thinking, is that right? That's a bit strange. But then eventually he said, I just accepted that. Well, that's swatter. And then I followed up and I said, well, what did you think when you found out that I live with mental health conditions? And his answer was a great answer. It answered a lot of my questions. And from that, Horse openly admits that, you know, when he started coaching, he had no understanding or education about mental health. And if people listen to his episode and no other episode, it's a great episode, he has invested considerable time getting an understanding about mental health. How do these conditions impact people? because he plays a really important role. He's got 42 players, he's got coaching staff, he's got support staff, he's got boards, he's got sponsors. He's not the expert, but he has a much better appreciation that mental health can affect any one of his players or his staff. One more question. The day you decided to go public in the way that you have, how much did that do for you? Yeah, I'll answer it with two things. Um, up until the 1st of March, 2006, I, in everything that I did outside of the four walls of my home, I lived a lie every day since the 9th of August 1993 until the 1st of March 2006 because I invested all of my effort pretending to people like you, my teammates, we're in an auditorium like we are here at Arden Street, coaches, everybody, my dad, my family. I lied. I lied to protect what was important to me. Um, and then when I decided to go public, it was the beginning of me actually getting my life back because I didn't have to worry about what people thought. What people think of me is not my business. Hopefully people like me, people respect me, um, but if they don't like me and they don't respect me, I'm actually comfortable with that because what I now do is I've lived with mental health conditions. Am I cured? Probably not, because I still have certain situations in my life or events that cause me stress. But I don't carry any shame. I'm not embarrassed. I've developed a skill set that allows me to manage certain situations. And I do all of the things that I should have done many years ago to prioritise and maintain my mental health. Um, that's good because I'm happy. Um, I've got three beautiful kids. I've got a great wife. I love my dad more than I've ever loved my more ever loved him um, before. And the really interesting thing with this Heath is, um, I've, I've up until up until I made a conscious decision in October of 2015 to go all in, and I mean all in. I've shared things that I've never shared with people outside of my family and my, my professional um, counsellors. And what's really interesting is that um, when you're People are going to make their own opinion about what I'm about to say. Men are expected to behave a certain way. 
strong, loyal, stoic, resilient, trustworthy, but men aren't meant to or expected to or encouraged to be sensitive, to be emotional, to be vulnerable, to, to be caring, to be sensitive, to be loving. Because that doesn't fit into the framework which is masculinity. Well, of the seven suicides every day in Australia, six are men. So of the 2,866 that tragically lost their lives in 2016, 2,151 were men. Men are really struggling. And I'm not saying women aren't, but we expect and accept that women will talk. They're emotional. They have feminine traits. But make no mistake, there's plenty of strong, tough, loyal, stoic, resilient women out there and strong women. But society has an expectation with regards to a way that a man needs to behave and a way that a woman needs to behave. I don't agree with that. And I think that this notion of masculinity is fundamentally flawed. And the, one of the great benefits uh, to me personally in the work that I now do is I have questioned, reflected and changed my view with regards to masculinity. Real strength are all of those traditional traits that a man might possess, as well as emotional intelligence and ability to be vulnerable to be open, to show his whole range of emotions and importantly to ask for help. And that is really, really important because in my opinion, the reason why six of the seven suicides every day in Australia are men is because men, A, think that they can't ask for help or it's weak to ask for help, or they're worried that other people will think that they are weak when they ask for help. I've had a number of conversations with men of all ages over the last 12 months and sadly some of those have been at funerals of people that have taken their lives. And the overriding consistent thing that these men have said to me, I'm hurting, I'm in pain but I can't ask for help and I ask why? Because I can't be seen as weak. So I'm grateful for my football career, I really am. And I have a great love for North Melbourne and Sydney for two different reasons. But that's a chapter that was written a long time ago. The work that I now do, with all due respect to my football career, is the most important thing that I can do outside of being a good dad and a great husband.